Flynn, are you there? I am, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me try this because what, what I did realize was I had one drive still sinking, so that was killing it, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, that kills it. That's disconnected now. I'm back. Let's 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 try it a third time. If it's not gonna work, we can we can call it, but again, see how okay. what happens, yeah? All right, let's yeah? do it. Are you happy with that? I'm happy with that. That's All right. Cool. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thanks, Thanks for, for holding with us. With us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, let me just pull this back up. I'm going to just throw that on the big screen. I'm going to swap that out. Cool. Yeah, I was just playing through this video, and really it was just sort of showing the old days and how, you know, they used to do their sort of stunts. Um, and talking about the second shot, which is, you know, taking some of the techniques of the olden days and actually using them, you know, similar to how we do them today in compositing, which is a process of layering up things. So you can see in the second shot where he's on the roller skates, he goes over, almost goes over the edge, and it feels like he's, you know, it's all one scene. But actually mm -hmm. that, that stairwell has been painted on a glass pane. You can see there that it's actually a separate layer to... Um, to the actual scene itself, so it's right. it's just clever ways that they were able to do these sort of tri uh, you know tricks or you know almost effects back in the day, and this is like back in 1936. So just just interesting to see how that was done. Mm. Um, well, let's move to the next one. So I just wanted to talk about you know what is a v effects artist. So when we look at the effects artist discipline um, essentially what they're doing is they're putting the you know the icing on the cake you know when you go through the 3d production pipeline everyone's building assets whether it's environments or whether it's characters the lighting and all the rest of it the effects guys go through and add all the really beautiful details like the smoke the dust um, you've got explosions you got you know rain you've got um, you know rushing water you've got mm. all these atmospheric things that just happen uh you know that you know these guys are able to add in so for example we can see here if i just play this one through you can see the dust being generated by the feet you've got the smoke you've got explosions you've got fire all this all these effects um are added by this department and you've got different types of effects as well even for the one you know one sort of um environmental uh I guess effect, you know. So you've got, you know, rain. You've got rushing water. You've got still water. So for all these different effects, um, it's it's very complicated stuff. Uh, it takes a lot of computer power to be able to generate the stuff. And what I wanted to just show you quickly was if I bring up uh, my browser window here, I'm going to just pull this across. And this this is kind of the basis to it. Now, I don't know if you can see that now, but mm. it's all yep. about particles and, and simulations, right? So you can see this is just a web will, uh, app that I found on the internet, but it explains really well how water and, and how these effects are created. And you can see it's just made up of, you know, thousands of these little particles and collisions and colliding and how they merge together. Mm. And you can go through and, and in here I can actually select different options. And you can see that, you know, this thing here is going to have an effect on these other smaller particles, right? Oh, so wow. cool. when, when, we th when we think of, um, you know, water effects and dust and all these different effects, it's really just lots and lots of particles and the way that they merge and the weight and, you know, gravity and all, and all the sort of the stuff that you learn in physics. Um, it, so, you know, you can... You can see here you can have a little little bit of fun with this little uh, widget um, just to see how these particles react differently with the uh, with the different um, environments and you can see that one's a lot faster um, so yeah just that's that's a really cool way just I just wanted to sh visualize how this stuff is done but this is on a on a really basic level that's really cool and um, I think that's been something that's been that's come up quite quite a lot is um, like just really fun things like this, like really like interesting links that you just open in your browser to play around um, with some of this stuff, which has been really cool. Cause there always seems to be that barrier of entry into 3D. Um, and I love that we just, you're just showing us so many examples that we can learn and have a play around just using the browser or using free software, which is great. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, that's what I sort of recommend to anybody that's wanting to get into this is, is just really start basic first. There's always that temptation to go straight into a big 3D program and start playing around with it. And, and it can be so overwhelming, you just get lost with it all. So, you know, being able to, to play with something um, really basic that's not going to bog your computer down just to get a really good understanding of how, how these things work is, is, uh, is, is really important. So just a couple of notes here of like, you know, if you wanted, if you're looking to get into this sort of discipline, what, you know, what you'd need to be a good effects artist. So really, you know, it's having a good understanding of science and like I said, physics, you know, how particles react, gravity, uh, collisions, simulations, all that sort of stuff. Having an understanding of that um, is key to being a good effects artist. Obviously having a good eye for detail when, when you look just observing in the real world and how things, you know, how water interacts with rocks and how the splash, you know, then dissipates, you know, like all that sort of observation of real world, you know, if you can you know, just mentally understand how that sort of works, again, when you get onto the computer, you'll have a better understanding and, and being able to source reference while you're doing this stuff is very key as well. Um, it's very technical, a lot of sort of coding goes into this sort of stuff. And I'm going to show you today how, you know, just with some of these packages, they do have off the shelf effects that you can just kind of drag and drop and be able to create explosions or effects with. So um, there, are, there is some easy stuff to, to be able to work with. Uh, and, you know, like I said, being, being programming, understanding programming, sort of C++ and basic sort of coding, uh, or not basic, some of that coding is, is quite full on. Um, and here's another shot just from Black Panther. And I just wanted to walk through this shot and really show, you know, how complex one, one shot can be, you know. So let's just play this. And it's just playing through the shot here. And you can see uh, how they got all these environments, all this, you know, all these uh, sets that in this one shot. So it's just, and I'm just going to break down exactly what has been done here. So when we look, the first thing is there's a full uh, replacement of the sky. So that's completely fake to start with. And then obviously the helicopter and the people that are flying through the air, they're all CG characters or what we call digital doubles. Now you can see the helicopter already firing and, and throwing up sort of particle effects. We've got foreground and background elements. So that's that's all split up into layers as well. Um, and then we've got the helicopter shooting up the ground. And you can see the different particles. If I just pause it there for a second, you can see, you know, if we just look at this, we've got these small ones, we've got the larger ones, we've got the glowing effect here, we've got the dust, we've got, you know, this effect, which is the laser beam, we've got fire coming off that. So these are all separated layers. Mm. And we're going to, when we get into compositing, we'll talk about how all this stuff is split out. And, you know, you can think about it. I don't know if people have played with After Effects, but you've got your different layers when you're uh, creating a comp. And it's essentially the same sort of thing. You're just splitting everything out so that the, uh, the compositor has control to be able to change and light things differently if need be instead of rendering out this whole thing which to render out the whole thing totally would take so many hours to do so if we just keep playing through this, this comes around it hits the hits the ground there's more effects thrown up in um and then there's the big explosion which happens with the helicopters, so there's, you know, there's, there's the, the different types of smoke that associate explosion. Um, there's the dust with the helicopter hitting the ground there, and then we have the background buildings, and again, digital, so these aren't real. Um, just in that one scene alone, you can see the complexity of just, just what goes into one shot. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think the internet loves... Um having the video being played at the same time as we're trying to, as we're trying to chat that seems to be overloading it just a little bit does it okay yeah. so we might need to right. pause it or f switch frame to frame i think it's struggling a little bit but otherwise we can okay good. okay cool no worries um, yeah i just i think you know my point here was was just to show you know the comp complexity just of one shot mm. um, so now what i wanted to do was just 
go into after uh, into Maya and take our Eddie character that we've um, used in the previous episodes and just run a bit of a, a you know a bit of an effects on him. We want to do what what's sort of happening here is convert him to sand and just make him you know dissipate across the ground. So I'm just going to bring up Maya. I'm just going to stop that for a sec. And I've got Maya open over here. So I've just added in our Eddie character here, so you can see, you know, it's just the 3D model. I've added a plane because when we've obviously we need a a, uh, a collision plane for that sand to land on. Well, you don't really, but we just want to see that effect. So when he turns to sand, he actually um, hits the ground plane. So, so plane in Maya, like, like we have the, just the ground, or is it always the ground, or is it also a wall, or is it like just whatever they're sitting on? You can basically select anything that you want to be a collision. So, for example, you know, maybe I wanted to do um, a, a sort of a shirt, you know, that was on top of on top of Eddie's main body here. I could make that geometry there. Um, if actually, it's it's all one shape at the moment. But if I had a single shape where I selected that, I could make that the collision piece, right? So that, you know, when I had my, you know, and I could duplicate that same piece of geometry and then turn that into like a shirt so that when it actually uh, had the effect of gravity and all that sort of stuff on top of it, it would then hit that base shell and collide with it and then kind of drape naturally based on, you know, the, sh the shape of that, that base um, geometry. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Cool. So in, um, actually just going to move that little screen if I can. Uh, let's move that out of the way. So in Maya, we, you know, there's a couple of areas where you can run effects. So there's like a little tab here, and again, there's um, little generators that I could assign to geometry, and you can do little particles effects and all the rest of it. You can see down the end here, again, this is what I was talking about, was running a cloth simulation. So if I wanted to uh, you know, like I said, create a piece of geometry there and run a simulation based on that. I could select these icons. There's another one that Maya has, which is called Bitfrost, and this is this is really cool for people that are kind of starting out because there's. Um, if I open up the browser here, you can see that there's already a whole bunch of like effects which you can add to your model already. Um, you can see there's different particles. Um, the sand, again, I'm going to create one from sand just to show you how that works. Um, but there's, yeah, there's already a library of different effects. So, for example, I could have Eddie, you know, smoking, you know, like just with by assigning this to the geometry. Um, so what I want to do here is just go in and I'm just going to show you uh, how to create one. So if I go new graph, and it's all node-based, right? So you can see here... No, these nodes are really uh, they're the little boxes of information, right? So I've got different. You can see here I've got different attributes that I can change inside that. It's really just a container. Um, I don't need an input because I've got my Eddie mesh, so I'm going to just delete that. And I'm going to grab Eddie and I'm going to right middle uh, middle mouse button and I'm going to just drag and drop Eddie straight into here. I'm going to bring Eddie down, and I'm also going to bring in my plane because I want that to be the collision. So I just drag that straight in as well. So now what I want to do is just create a few nodes. So I said before that I want to turn them into sand. So if I just hit tab, um, I can hit sand. So I've got this sand little node here, which is going to create a new one. And what I can do with this is now just hook this mesh up, um, and I'm going to just basically hook that into my source. So I've got uh, my sand properties. I'm going to just do mesh into geometry because that's my um, what I want the geometry to be looking at. I want my sand to affect my geometry. And now I'm just going to do a tab again. I'm going to just do a collider because I'm going to say, hey, this plane is what I want my, my character here to collide with. Again, I'm just going to go into geometry. I can change settings in here, you know, like if I wanted to change, for example, um, the size 
of uh, the particles. I can go in and make them smaller. So I could just do 0.4 there. And so, you know, you're trying to basically just, you know, if it's if it's something that's bigger, if like it's snowflakes, then you're just, you know, essentially um, changing the scale of different um, of the different particles. So I've got my collider, I've got my sand. What I need now is a, a sim to basically say, hey, you know what, I need to simulate this. So again, I'm going to hit tab. I'm going to hit um, my, I've got a solver and a simulate, simulate here. So I hit simulate, and this is the main sort of node that I'm going to connect everything up with. And I need one more, which is a solver, which is going to solve this, solve the, solve the sand that's fed into the. So you can see, even just from this one character of trying to, you know, do sand, it's it's quite complex already, right? Mm, so yeah. you can imagine, imagine how big some of these networks get of, or node networks get with some of the characters. Um, I'm just going to grab that solver. And now we just need to connect all these up to our main node here. So I'm just going to move all that stuff up. And I'm going to say my collider is going to go into my collider down here. You can see colliders, collider. And then my source goes into source there. And then the solver is going to go into settings just down here. Right? So now hopefully I've got my character who's going to turn into sand. It's going to simulate the whole thing. I could change, uh, again, I could change the, the size here to maybe something like 0.4. I'm not going to get into real details, but you can see how you know easily you could get lost in this world. Mm. And then once, once I um, assign this to, uh, so I'm going to, to my output, you're going to see what's going to happen. So it's going to go through now and it's going to go calculate. And if I just hide that, interface once it just allows me to do that you can see now we've got like, like this you know our little particles on top of our character so I'm going to be for a second so we can see how those particles react so I go into object display I'm just going to hide that geometry and now if I hit play on my timeline hopefully something will happen And very, very slowly, you can see Eddie is starting to collapse. And he's going to hit that ground plane, which we've told is the collision plane. And it's all going to disperse across the top of that surface. Yeah, cool. So from here, you know, you can go and color those particles. You can do, you know, have other influences. Maybe you, you make the gravity have, um, stronger so they fall faster. You could add more more particle details to it. It's, there's, you know, the possibilities are endless when you start getting into this world. Um, so you can see, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So, and you can see, you know, I've got a, I've got a pretty decent laptop and you can see that like it's, you know, taking a while to, to sort of run the simulation. Once it's run, it's once and it's cached, it's okay. But as soon as you start changing parameters, again, it needs to recompute it and then it takes, you know, takes time. So, mm. um, we're almost finished there. And you can see actually even the particles running off the edge of that plane. So the particles are st have a lifespan. So depending on what you set, you can keep those particles alive forever or maybe you want them to disappear after a certain time um, and they can they can disperse. So we're almost getting towards the end of that timeline there and hopefully it'll just play back a little bit smoother. And we've got it there. So that's why I did the play blast so we can just see it sort of working in action there. But I'm going to stop it there. And if we bring back up, and you can see this is, can you see that, Flynn? Yep, okay. Yep, if I play that. that. Full screen demo. Yep. Oops. Yep. So, and then if I just play that, I don't know how, it'll just plays a little bit more smoother than what the yeah. sim was doing. So you can see there that he's just, uh, he's now turning into sand and he's gone. So that's kind of, you know, that's a really, really basic effects of how to set it up and just showing you, you know, using these nodes um, and, and the sort of the, you know, the complexity of it all. Mm.
And was that, I, I'm sorry, I may have missed it, but was that a plugin or was that sort of something that was built into Maya? I missed that part. Yeah, it's it's built into Maya. To activate it, you need to go to um, a setting that's in um, in your Windows preferences and then you got plugin. So it's a plugin for Maya and you can activate it through that way. But like I said, there's a there's a whole bunch of presets that you can already you already use for it. Um, and like I said, the other option would be just to go in and start using some of these effects, which is the by default the uh, Maya's um, effects tab. So in here, you know, like this here. So obviously, you know, when you think of a movie like Brave, you know, with the girl, I, I can't even remember the name, but with the with bushy red hair, mm. you know, that hair is colliding with the cloth that is being simmed and moving around, you know, and then she goes into water. It's just, it blows my mind how all this stuff then interacts with each other. You know, when you think about what we've just done here, how that all just works together is just, it's amazing, mm. you know. Um, and I think, you know, it's, yeah. So, but just jump back to, to, so did anybody just have any questions as far as effects goes at this point? Yeah. Um, so we were chatting about plugins, like, are there any must have plugins mm. or is every, or is there so much in, there's so much in like Maya cause we, we talked about so many different softwares, but yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there's. If you're talking about Maya, there's so much in Maya that you really don't want to start looking at plugins, you know, and plugins are really specific, you know, it'd be something if it's been created for a, a particular um, function, but within Maya itself, really need to be looking for plugins. Um, there's, there's obviously plugins to help workflows and tools and all the rest of it, but for the most part, if you're a beginner, you know, I would be looking at, like I said, looking at something like Blender, um, and we'll talk about Blender later, which is, it's a, it's a free bit of 3D software. There is so much, you know, great tutorials online. Actually, there's an Australian guy called Andrew Price, who's um, Blender Guru, who's got a YouTube channel. <clears throat> and he's got a lot of really great uh, introduction 3D um, tutorials for, for Blender. Um, there's another site called CG Cookie, which is all about Blender, again, great tutorials, um, a lot of free stuff on there. And that's it's kind of your entry point. That's where I'd be sort of, you know, looking at, at playing around in this sort of space if I was to get into it. Um, there were some questions around, um, so uh, I think it was um, Jan who's in there, which is great to see you in there, um, was saying, um, love to get into 3D, but they've, um, you know, have a fairly unpowerful Mac computer. We covered some of this in the first one, but maybe just off the top of your head, what are some of the things you can do if you don't have a powerful computer or you're, Mac based. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'd be looking at definitely getting um, using software that's not so intense like Maya. Um, if you've got a MacBook Pro like Maya and and Blender and these sorts of programs do run on it, I've got a MacBook Pro and it runs it runs fine. When you're getting into this world with doing a fix, again, you know, you really need. I mean, even like I said, my machine struggles with it. So um, I'd be looking at just doing really. So you get there's some softwares out there, uh, and I think I list them out actually, which is mm. outside of this big high end stuff, and it's really just it's it, you know software that is specific for effects, and that's not so intensive for your computer. I'd be looking at stuff like that. Yeah, you know, um, just just and and it's you know people just love it and they want to dive into it and they just want to get into the the high end stuff, but you know it, it, it soon kills your spirit for this stuff when, you know, nothing actually works. Mm. So just, you know, you have to learn to walk first before you can run. And it's the same thing here. Just start with really basic programs that aren't going to chew up a lot of uh, GPU and CPU power and just um, start basic first. Yeah, cool. Um, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so... Yeah, just because uh, just relating to the um, the pipeline that you showed before, we've been talking a lot about the pipeline. Is just what mm -hmm. are some of the common obstacles in in that three D pipeline? Common obstacles. Um, we've got it there, so we'll bring it up so people can see it as well. This is what we're talking about. This is what we've been kind of using as our bit of a reference, our bit of go to map um, of what's going on, focusing on a very specific kind of area. But yeah. Are there, are there particular obstacles in there, I guess, either as a practitioner or just in, in general? Yeah, I think, you know, from my experience, you know, like the like um, the effects 
is 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 you know like if i was to look at any of these disciplines and go hey you know which one's the easiest or which one's the most artistic and which one's the most technical and um and which one's at the you know the sort of the bottom end of the pipeline where you know you just you you're the bottleneck you know you you basically for every mistake that happens in each of these departments it gets exasperated by the time it gets to compositing and these these lower ends right so mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if, there's, if there's certain areas, if, if I was to call out the more technical areas, I, you know, rigging is definitely a technical area, effects heavily a technical area, rendering is very technical, um, compositing not so much, it can be. Each, each, each of the departments do have an element of technical involved with it, but uh, the ones that I just called out then are the ones that are more swayed towards the technical. So obviously when there's more technical, there's more room for, for problems. You know, there's, there's lots of things that can go wrong. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd probably say when I'm looking at the, the production pipeline. And again, this is very, uh, VFX, 3D animation specific, this type of pipeline. If we were to look at, you know, architecture visualization um, or, you know, um, a small advertising or commercial broadcast company type thing, you know, a lot of these disciplines, you know, merge into, you know, you have an, an artist that would knows how to model. They know how to texture. They're more of a generalist. And in some ways, you know, where we see with uh, the, the sort of the way that technology is going, generalists are becoming more and more, um, uh, I guess, uh, sought after because of the fact that they do know a lot more. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about these big, big studios, then it's still very much discipline based. Yeah. Oh, cool. The, I, I love this. I love this pipeline. Just the person that has the idea is just in bed. And that's definitely who I want to be <laughs> like in this pipeline. Um, but I feel like I'm much more the rabbit with the head on fire. Um, uh, I was just going to say, Flynn, just to add, just to add to this image, there's actually another I seen on the internet. There's another, there's another pillar down here, which I didn't dare add, but basically it gets to this final output and then it goes through and it's going, okay, the movie's been presented back to the client, but then the client goes, oh, actually, no, we want the rabbit to be a frog right. or something <laughs> like that. And, and then it has to go all, and then it's just, it's, it's quite funny, but I didn't add that in because it's just, uh, yeah. You're trying to encourage it, people to get into, uh, into exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you get right. And, and, and to be honest, I've worked on scenes and movies, you know, I've spent months on characters and on, on a shot, you know, and for, for it to be cut right at the very last minute, like mm. you spent all this time and all this energy creating something beautiful. And then the director goes, no, nah, cut that scene. We don't want it anymore. You know, so um, it happens. It happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's also saying, got to give a shout out to this. Um, if I ran a render farm, the GPUs will be free roaming, um, which is great. Um, Excellent. Okay. Thanks for some questions. Actually, yeah, I didn't really mention it, but yeah, you can feel free to ask questions as we're going along. We're not going to take like a Q and a break because we're covering so many different areas today. So just feel free to, to throw questions is in as we go along. Yeah, exactly. Feel free. It's the last session. We want it to be a bit more free form. What I wanted to do here, and this is a shout out to a school that's in um, Mont uh, Montreal and Vancouver, and they specialize in effects and compositing and sort of lighting for visual effects. But this, I just wanted to show an example, and this is a student that came from that school, um, and just show you know what a, a sort of a student demo reel would look like, just so that you can have some sort of idea of like um, the level that you'd sort of need to be at. So I'm just gonna play this through. And again, you know, it's it's all that description. And, and the key thing with effects is, you know, it's the scale of things. Is that playing through okay, Flynn? Yeah, yeah, looking great. Yeah, wow. Yeah. It's very real. Yeah, so you can see here, you know, the destruction. Um, and like I was saying, you know, when, when, when you've got explosions and you've got, you know, each, each sort of, I guess, you know, if you've got a fire and it's being, you know, it's, it's a wood fire, the smoke is different to something that is a fire that's being lit by fuel right so mm. there's a really and it's a different style of smoke the way that it comes out so it's not just 
one smoke fits all. Um, and then this is, you know, gets a real life observation, being able to really understand how, how things look. Um, so, you know, even though there's these sort of presets and templates that you can use, there's still a, a lot of fine tuning that needs to happen to make it look realistic, right? And you can see here, um, we've got this character again, you've got lighting effects, the glows, you've got this transformation of the fuzzy thing, and then you've got the smoke. And then you've got stuff like pyrotechnics. Again, you know, you can see that it's, it's, um, it's very, uh, whoops, let's just play that, Oop, go through that. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It can be, fr I mean, I couldn't do it because it's so frustrating to sort of sit there and have to wait and watch this stuff to kind of like for the simulation to have. And I know, you know, teams that I've worked with in the past, they, you know, these guys have a lot of patience. But, uh, you know, it's about optimizing and just, you know, doing the, the basics really, really first without going in and more, and more complexity to it. Um, but guys that are really good at it have a very, very good eye. You know, they just, they understand scale, they understand weight, they understand how gravity and, and turbulence and all this sort of stuff affects, you know, the final effects. Um, so I have a lot of respect for those types of guys. Mm. So just have a mouthful of water and then we're going to get into talking about compositing unless somebody had a question about effects just before I finish up on that one. Not a question, um, but yeah, just to comment, the best uh, CGI is when you don't even notice it in the first place. Yeah, exactly, right? And it's, you know, I think, you know, when we look at effects now, it's it's so in our faces. Every day we're looking right. at it, you know, every, every commercial that's on TV has got some sort of effects in it, you know, whether it's a McDonald's commercial with, you know, ice cream or chocolate sauce or whether it's a, a you know, a, you know, a chocolate commercial for that matter, or it's a car commercial with a dust coming off the tire, like nearly every, every com car commercial is fake, right? The car is completely CG. That's why they have the windows blacked out. Uh, when it's going up terrains and hills and stuff that, you know, that the car's still spotless, but yet it's going through these muddy terrains. You're just yeah. like, mm, something, a bit, something a bit wrong with this image. Um, is but it it's all that they use like, like a, a dummy car, like, like, like some sort of like fake car and then they, they go over it and then they just CGI everything over the top or do they just get panning footage? And just go, yeah, well, that's the scenery we want, and then everything CG from the computer. Pretty much, it's, it's either that way where it's just a background, and then everything is, you know, recreated in CG, or it's just the whole thing is just recreated in CG, right? right. So whether it's the environments to, you know, everything is just CG replacement. Um, yeah, sometimes they'll keep, you know, it might be just a, you know, a, a sort of environment shot, you know, where it's just that panning landscape or whatever it is, it's kind of easy to do. But the the, the car or the vehicle will be, see, you know, comp composited back into that background plate. Mm -hmm. And that's a good se segue into compositing, actually, um, because these guys are really, at, like I said, at the end of the pipeline, um, they really pick up everybody else's mess. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, and they try and, you know, piece it all together to be able to create the final sort of beautiful image that then goes off to be rendered. Um, so when we look at compositing, and you can see it a little bit here in this background, I think I've got more examples of it. So if we just go through, I uh, actually, Flynn, I think I was going to get you to play that video. Cause oh, yeah. I've got this, I found this video on YouTube and it just, it was perfect because it explains compositing like just so well and i thought you know what this guy does it way better than i could just by watching it visually so if you could play that that would be great all right let's check it out everyone grab your popcorn lots of creativity yeah. and a high level of skill this world is called the fx and is built from many parts in a long pipeline that creates something amazing and that's what you see on the big screen the last role in this long pipeline of visual effects is called digital compositing, which is a creative process of assembling filmed and rendered elements from multiple sources to create a final lifelike illusion. What is that, you ask? Let me show you. It's a profession that includes many skills such as rotoscoping, which separates the foreground from the background, and there are all kinds of techniques to accomplish it. In films, it is common to use a blue or green screen to easily remove the background from behind the actors, and that is called keying. 
And by doing that, we can create a more realistic background behind the actor. Tracking is another side of the story, and it is very important to know how to do well. There's 2D tracking, and there's 3D tracking, which recreates the exact movement of the camera. Another big part of this job is to remove objects, cables, and trackers, and paint them out and insert something else instead. And, of course, there is computer-generated elements, or, in short, CG compositing. Yeah, but my friends always say VFX looks fake. I was, I got it's great, admit, isn't it? I was, I was onto them when I saw the Banksy on the wall. I, I was like, I don't think that's <laughs> it. I don't think <laughs> that's, a, that's a legit Banksy. But that, that's, that's great, isn't it? Like, what a great example um, that, you know, a lot of the elements there were completely fake, completely CGI, but made to look so real. And unless someone exactly. pointed it out, you'd have no idea. Yeah, no, exactly. No, it's a great little video. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, just, just to recap on that. So a compositor is essentially, you know, taking... Um, all the elements that have been created by all the other departments, uh, you know, you've got matte paintings, you've got your, your CG elements, you've got um, your effects, you know, you've got your lighting passes, you've got everything. And those guys are really just collecting all that up and then, you know, making it, um, to, making it into that final image. Mm. So, yeah, so I just wanted to talk about um, the different softwares. So basically, you know, you've got Nuke, which is the, the sort of the high-end um, compositing software used in, in visual effects and used in um, 3D, 3D production pipelines. And you can see here, it's similar to what we were looking at in Maya when we were building out that sort of node graph with that simulation. Mm -hmm. It's essentially connecting nodes uh, to each other to then, you know, so you can imagine, for example, that one of these nodes um, is, is your, your, your effects and then another node might be your, your, uh, your CG element. So it's just layering on, you know, using these nodes and you're doing A over B and you're doing different um, blend modes and all that sort of stuff and you're able to kind of grade uh, images and sequences based off these nodes. And so, so what are each uh, like individual node? Is it like this? This is our this is our dust, or this is our particles, or this is an object, or? Yeah, exactly, Finn. So if we look at this one down here, it's it's really an image sequence, mm. right? So um, if you've got a shot, the shot might might you know might be a hundred frames. So during that hundred frames, there is you know some dust that happens off the foot you know off the foot hitting the ground. So then that dust is separated out and you've got 100 frames of that dust. So then that image sequence is then imported into Nuke and you've got that one node here. And then, you know, the, the second, you know, then you've got another image sequence would be of that CG foot that's animating over that 100 frames, right? And then that's another layer or another node. Just think of nodes kind of like layers. Um, and then once you've got those nodes, then you're basically going, okay, cool, I want my smoke on top of my foot. So I need to make sure that the merge is A over B, you know, whatever the mate, whatever the merge is, right? So really you're just using nodes to layer things up. And then once you've got your, you know, maybe your smoke here and it's not bright enough or it's too dark, then you can add another node to that and it just it controls the brightness and contrast. So you can just keep building out nodes. So, you know, when you're a compositor, you know, one of the most important things to to learn is how to you know, do sort of script management or node management because if you're not organized and somebody else picks up your your um, scene, um, they just it's it's going to be a complete mess because you can imagine how big some of these node networks get, right? Mm. Um, so, so like that's yeah, that version of like um, labeling your 
your layers in Photoshop and yeah. hand it off to someone to try to use. Exactly right. So they do have, you know, like yeah, in Photoshop, you have folders and you can, you know, say, hey, here's my foot, you know, and here's another photo, which is all my effects. And it's got smoke and, and dust and all the rest of it in there. Mm. Um, in Nuke, you can actually frame things and just con in, into containers as well so that it keeps it nicely color coded. So and you can go, OK, cool. Here's all the foot stuff. Here's all the effects stuff. Here's all the lighting stuff, you know, so you can you can easily organize it in Nuke as well. Um, and then when we look at the other side of the coin, we've got, you know, things like After Effects and Premiere. So this, you know, this is where you're just using layers to be able to do exactly the same thing, but just in a different way. Um, and, you know, After Effects is, you know, that's kind of where I started when you're kind of in that sort of CG and you're doing your first demo reel, um, you know, After Effects is, is kind of the place. And it's, you know, After Effects isn't, it's a relatively easy learning curve for compositing to get into, um, but you know it's a great place to start because you understand, start understanding these blend modes and how to layer things up and create masks to be able to bring things through and drop things back. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk a little about Adobe Rush and I'm going to do a bit of a just a quick demo of that because I think you know for people wanting to get into compositing Adobe Rush is an amazing place to start because it is so simple and so easy to use that you know you can just get a, a really good result and it's uh it's it's like I said easy to use cool and then and then you go to Adobe Premiere which is kind of like it says there Premiere uh compositing software like the premiere is also used in, in visual effects movies um, it's high-end a lot more a lot more features to be able to do cool effects within premiere as well um, so what is a good compositor uh, what is a compositor good at again you know there's a there's a re reoccurring theme with a lot of these different disciplines and it's 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 about real world observation and having a good eye it's understanding again if we go back to our photography roots and talk about materials, shadows, how light falls on different surfaces, um, all those key components of training your eye. Like I remember when I went to art school, the first day that I went to art school, my art teacher said to me, he said, when you leave here, you're going to see things very, very differently. And I didn't understand what he meant by that. Um, and it was, you know, like when you start really looking at the world um, through an artistic eye and really observing things, you know, for us in, in a general day to day, you know, we just, it's, it's, we're not, we're not really studying things. And it's just kind of like things are happening at such a rapid rate. Mm. But when you slow things down and you really look at details and you do start to see certain qualities, it's amazing how your perception of the real world changes. And I remember coming out of art school and I could look at things, and I did, I was, I, I looked at things totally different from that first day that I started. Mm. Um, so again, you know, being able to work in a team environment, all these themes here are, are, are the same with every other department. Compositors are very organized. They, they, you know, they have to be good team players because they essentially talk to every department. So they're always, like I said, collecting bits of information from all departments. So they have to be uh, good with communication and, and you know, your skills. Um, and like I said before, script organization being able to make sure that your scripts are really well organized for other people to to pick up so what i wanted to do here was just jump into uh, my creative cloud and just show um you know if we go up to video and motion here so we've got some amazing adobe's got some amazing compositing tools already which i'm not too sure if people are aware of but obviously after effects is the um the one that I started with, which, you know, I, I actually, for motion graphics and stuff, I actually really loved After Effects. Um, and, you know, the, new, the the node world could get complex. If you're a visual person, then, you know, After Effects and um, Premiere are, are the, are the go-to. So I just wanted to open uh, Premiere Rush. Now, you can download this on your phone. I use it all the time just to create quick videos, either for Instagram or for whatever it is. But it's just, again, it's a really basic editing tool um, and when I just wanted to show you how how easy it was to, to create something I think we were talking so, about um, TikTok yesterday 
And um, yeah, I think it, oh, yeah? Has, it, it has an export directly to TikTok feature as well for, for all of you TikTok lovers out there. It does. Nice. Nice. So I'm just going into my downloads directory. I've got a few images and a few movies. There's a bit of a, a mixture going on here. So depending on what order I select them in, that's going to determine how it gets dropped into the, my timeline. So maybe I'm going to grab an image there. I might grab another image. Um, we've got our Black Panther that we looked at before. Maybe I'm going to grab another demo reel or a bit of Ant-Man. Why not a little bit of Ant-Man? And I think we're good. We'll just grab the three things, maybe four, and then I'm going to create that. So it's going to drop those, like I said, in the right order that we selected it in. So um, it's 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 super easy. I mean, I can't stress how easy uh, Rush is to use. So you can see here, I've got my character. I'm down, disposition, make sure he's all good. Um, I can move each of these parts around on my timeline. Now, basic compositing um, is is all about you know editing and cutting and making sure you've got the right frame length and also, like I said before, about layering things up. Um, so you know, for for a rush, for example, I can go through and I can just easily cut things. And the great thing with rush is like, if I was to make a couple of different cuts here, I can just delete and it will automatically snap to that area. You know, I'm not having to position, move it around like that. So it makes things very easy. Um, and then I've got your diff, you know, different transitions up here, just the usual, like, but if, if I was to do a demo reel nowadays, then I would just kind of like go, you know what, I'm going to render out my clips, I'm going to bring it into Rush, I can do a really quick edit um, in Adobe Rush and ex export that out and share it straight away. So very, very simple to use. Um, I can detach my music or whatever it is from the separate the audio clip if I wanted to bring in my own audio I can do things like that. I can add text. I can speed up and I can slow down certain um, video clips if I need to. Uh, it really is, you know, how many, what have you got? One, two, three, four, five, six, six little menu items here. And then there's, you know, there's nothing to it. Um, again, I've got my sort of basic tools for cutting and editing my video clips. Um, and, you know, if I wanted to share that, uh, I can go across to share. And you know what I love about this is it's just it's so easy to export out, Flynn. I don't know, like yeah. you know, whenever you export whenever I export something out of After Effects or, you know, some other sort of compositing tool, you know, I have to then go and reformat or try and bring the size down and optimize it. You know, it just does it all for us in here, which I really, really love. Yeah, I love I, I yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love that too. I've actually brought Premiere profiles in to rush when I was finished with it anyway, just because I knew that if I just throw it into rush when after I'd exported it, it'd just figure it all out for me and pop it out. I know that's not the right way to do it. I should be using Medio Encoder or something like that, but I just knew it would work. And so that's what I do a lot of the time. Yeah. Actually, this is, a, I didn't even re really pick up on that. And I'm just going to play this because this is a really, can you, I'm going to just play this through, but this is actually a really good um, example of somebody compositing something. So you can see here, they've got their base geometry, you know, these assets here. And then there's, you know, these, that's what textured and then they're adding the various layers on top of it, right? So that was just a really, you can see the effects being added in now. Um, and then you can see the animations being added in. You've got more effects. It's just a, it was actually just a really, oh, here we go. Like, yeah. Again, just adding all those various layers to get our final image. That's cool. Look at that bonus example. Boom. Got it all there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I thoroughly recommend people that are interested in compositing or just want to do video is idiot edits um then you know just grab rush like i said it's for the for the phone as well so it's super cool um yeah after effects i'm not going to open those ones but i just wanted to also show that in the creative uh cloud desktop app you know we've got our 3d and ar one here so um this is where you can and i, I demonstrated mixamo i think it was in the first episode mm. um 
this is where you can actually la launch Mixmo here. You got Dimension. I think I, I, w I went did a bit of a, a demo in Dimension as well. So you're able to access all your apps really nicely within the desktop uh, little app here. Cool. So I think we've got how much time, Flynn? Because I'm I'm very wary that I like almost ran over last time. Um, yeah. Um. So we've got I just a hard cut off at 25 minutes, but we don't have to go for the whole time either. So it depends on questions. So it depends on how many questions we get through today. But I think we're doing okay. So, okay, we're doing okay. So what I wanted to do, if there's any questions on compositing, I just wanted to start talking about, hey, like where, where if I was really interested in this, uh, how, where do I start? How do I start this journey of getting into um, 3D? So I just wanted to, you know, talk about schools that are in this region that people could start looking into. The types of questions that you need to start thinking about if you're, you know, if you're at high school, you know, well, how do I start, right? So like it's all this type of stuff that I really want to um, spend a little bit of time on um, today. So first, first things first, where to study? You know, the big question, you know, it's like. And actually, it's not even the first. It's not even the first part. The first part is convincing your parents that you want to get into this industry, right? Because you've probably been playing a lot of games, and you know, it's, your parents don't realize that it's actually there's a career. You know, people can have careers in this this field. Um, so you know, you have to talk to them and go. You know what? Actually, you can make really good money. You know, working in games or visual effects or any of these sort of 3D industries. Um, and you know, just just being able to con convince them first is probably your first first step. The second step is like where to study. So if we look at schools that are kind of in this, and I've just listed out a handful here that um, that I know of. Um, I'm sure there's loads more. There's there's loads of school that is schools that are teaching 3D animation and visual effects at various levels. Uh, in Australia, you know, you've got your AIEs, you've got your TAFEs, your SAEs. Um, you've got schools that are really direct, you know, that have really good um, connections with studios. So this is kind of a new thing that's happened in the last sort of five years where schools will partner up with a studio and actually you get sort of like real world experience with that. Um, you've got like in Adelaide here, we've got Rising Sun Pictures that are partnered with University of South Australia. Um, you've got CDW studios that are partnered with Flinders University. So what happens there is students will, you know, do the first couple of years, you know, getting the foundations, and then they they, they sort of it's almost like a master's or finishing school, and right. they get to be able to work in the studio on real projects, um, and it's just like a little bit more hands-on and full-on. UTS Animal, Animal Logic are a great example based in Sydney of, you know, and they're really pushing the boundaries of what what is the school environment. You know, when you look at how they've got it set up, they've actually got it set up like a real studio environment. So you come in as a, as a not, not even as a student, but as an employee of that school and you're working on a project and you're, you know, you're doing getting critiqued by industry professionals, you're learning the, the, the state of the art software. It's re everything about that school is set up like a mm. real world studio. Um, and they have you know amazing facilities there. Then you've got school like Afters, Australian Film and Television School, um, and they specialize in production. So you know if you're wanting to actually Go learn how to, you know, how to film, you know, and be a director and be, you know, in the production side of things. Then they specialise in that. I know that they've got new 3D courses coming out. Um, but when you look at these schools, you know, what I say to people is that, you know, it's not the only option, right? You can actually teach yourself this stuff as well. There's so much amazing content online on YouTube um, that you could you could actually teach yourself. Um, you know, you can download something like Blender. You can, it's free, you can then just spend hours and hours going online, learning tutorials and doing it that way. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Mm -hmm. What's out of the online schools? I'm just thinking like of, a, of having like an online kind of more global audience, like which, because there's a lot there, like which out of those like reaches out to you as kind of the, either the top tier, which is probably a paid one, and then maybe the best free one? Like are you able to guide us through? <laughs> 
yeah those two options. yeah i mean i'm i'm basing this obviously from the you know from the rookie school you know global school rankings because just to, i'm not too sure if people are aware of that but we talked about the rookies last week um and the rookies because we have this massive contest every year you know where we have like four well, i think we had four thousand you know entrants this year from all around the world so what we're able to do is kind of identify where those best students are studying. And then from that, where we release a white paper going, hey, we think these are the best schools in the world mm. based on the quality of students, employability, uh, lecturers, all these different sort of criteria that we look at go, we think this is school is doing an amazing job. Um, so looking at that online list school, uh, school list, you know, the obvious standout ones there are like your think tank training center. Now, a lot of these schools are almost finishing schools. So you will have had to have done some sort of groundwork or some sort of training to, to be able to go to it. Think tank training has online where they have fundamentals, 3D fundamentals. So you can actually start with nothing um, and go to these schools. They do an amazing job. Why do they do an amazing job? Because they have really close ties to industry and industry mentors are the guys that are teaching you. So these are the guys that are doing you know, the amazing effects and working in the industry. You've got Noman School of Visual Effects in LA. Again, an amazing school, close ties with industry. They've been around for a long time. These schools are the ones that sort of always, you know, not, you know, always feature in our global school rankings, just because when we see the student work that comes out of it, it's phenomenal. These mm. students get employed, employed straight away. Um, you've got, you know, uh, the, so they, these are all paid ones, but when you look at the free ones, like obviously Khan Academy is free. Yeah. You can go there. Um, and a lot of these schools will also kind of do an introduction. I know, you know, CG Spectrum, the guys that are based here in Australia, they have, you know, of, um, often have uh, an intro to 3D, 3D for free. Um, so you can, you know, as long as you're kind of looking out for it, you can, you know, there's, but like I said, even online, there's so much amazing stuff online for free. It's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, there's the big U US based schools like Full Sail and SCAD and Ringling. They're all, you know, they all do phenomenal jobs. Um, yeah. Cool. I thought it was rigging College of Fine Arts because I'm looking on a smaller screen at first and I was like, wow, that's very specific. <laughs> like a whole whole college just for the rigging, rigging process. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and actually one that I haven't gone on, oh, I've got the sort of, that's the one that I was talking about before was Lost Boys School. Um, they right. they specialize, you know, solely in effects and in lighting and in compositing, you know, so they don't do everything. They, they're very specific to um, certain disciplines. So you do get those types of schools. Then you have, you know, industry mentors that have created their own um, sort of YouTube channel or websites that, um, you know, I'm thinking out loud here, but there's there's one guy who's a gaming, you know, big gaming um, environment artist called Josh Lynch. And he has, you know, what he has when you do those sort of mentor classes is that he has amazing contacts with the in, the in the industry, right? So not only are you doing it a course with somebody that's really well respected and has amazing skills in the industry, but you're also tapping into his network of contacts, right? So yeah. if you show that, hey, you've got some skills, then he, you know, like he's a, he's a great guy. Um, and I know he would go, you know what, go talk to so-and-so, you know, over here, because I know they've got jobs. So you get that sort of connection and that sort of networking. And it's an important thing to know as well. Like you can be the most amazing 3D artist um, as a student going through learning all this stuff. And if you can't get yourself out there and your social skills haven't been adapted or developed enough to be able to, you know, network and reach out to people, you're, ne you're never going to be discovered, right? So there's, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of benefits about, you know, going to events, going to conferences, yep. going to, you know, Adobe Education Days, going to Symposium, going to all these things um, to talk to people. The more you talk to people, the more you'll get networked. The more you'll, the more opportunities will come your way. Uh, it's it's a it's a major issue in the industry of like people that just, you know, hide away in their bedrooms or in their classrooms and just don't know how to sell themselves or get their get their work out there, right? So really, really important to be able to network and just make contact. I always tell people, create a LinkedIn account. You know, LinkedIn should be the first. Doesn't matter how much 
um, work experience that you have or don't have, create a LinkedIn account because you can, you know, then start, um, you know, finding out who the recruiters are in the different companies, where the schools are. There's so much great information on LinkedIn as well um, that it's it's a really great resource. Cool. Um, any questions here before I launch into this stuff? There's a bunch of questions. Um, I'm, so we've got a little bit, uh, about 15 minutes left. So I can ask some of these questions now that have come up in chat or we can move on to the Absolutely, next yeah, shoot. Ask questions. All right, we'll do questions. Yeah. Um, is Alan, is Alan related to Ethan Hunt? We'll just start with a low ball. Uh, mate, I get that all the time. I look like, <laughs> I used to look like Tom Cruise. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, but, um, taller. No, taller. no, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, much taller. Um, no, I am not not related to Ethan Hunt. No although related. I wish I got the sort of money, got the sort of money he did while working on films. <laughs> um, uh, I don't understand this question, so uh, you answer it if you do. Uh, do you get your three D briefings on self destructing tape decks? Oh, I get it. I get it. It's like the. It's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah, I get oh, it. Oh, Mission Impossible. Yeah, there oh, you go. I get, I get yeah. jokes. I'm, yeah, I get it, jokes. Uh, I'm not, I'm not asking, that old, but I get <laughs> With compositing, um, is it relatively easy to knock out backgrounds on a main image in a clip so you can place it with a transparent background or whatever you like? Yeah, so, I mean, it goes back to that little video that we watched with, um, you know, being able to do... Oh, well, actually... Yeah, I mean, in Photoshop, you know, we've got the the new um, selection tool, right? Yeah. What's that one, Flynn? It's like it's subject, a pretty amazing one. Subject selection tool. Like, tool yeah. So um, like, when you, yeah, exactly. So you know, in visual effects or in compositing, you've got um, what they call rotoscoping, right? So it does it. It mentioned it in that video where basically you, you create a series of points around whatever the thing is that you want to cut out of the background, um, and then you can. You know, fill in where that piece has been removed. So it's it's pretty straightforward to do that. Uh, and then you know, obviously you've got the the key um, color keying where you can replace backgrounds and stuff like that. But you can actually you know you can go through and rotoscope things out so to replace it, which which was uh, demonstrated in that little video. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And there's been some pretty amazing updates to the rotoscoping as well. It's a lot faster at the moment. Uh, well, it's a lot, lot faster now, um, After Effects, which is pretty pretty cool. There's been some demos on Adobe Live with that one. Um, yeah. Augmented reality. Yeah, I've seen one. Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go for it. All right. Augmented reality. It's also an intriguing part of 3D. Um, what, what, are your thought, what are your thoughts on, yeah, AR and, and, and that part, you know, in, in conjunction yeah, with Yeah, good 3D? question. Yeah, good good question. It's um, I think it's going to be huge. Um, we're seeing a real shift in AR, like in in sort of retail spaces. So you can you can imagine, um, you know, you've modelled a shoe. You're able to you know actually then bring that into an or, or you know into something like Aero, where you can see it in 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 a um, augmented uh, you know environment. So you know, for example. If I'm buying a shoe, and actually I had this example the other day, like because you know, like I was talking to you, Flynn, about we're just doing some renovations at the moment, and you know, like we're ch changing the light fittings, and you go into a light shop, and I was just so overwhelmed with um, the different types of lights, and I was just like, oh man, how cool would it be if they had a catalogue of all these lights that were created in 3D and modelled that then I could just select on this and bring it into AR into my app and be able to just, you know, map out my my living room and be able to drop that, you know, the different lights in there just to, so I could visualize how it could look in my space, yeah. you know? So when you think of that from a retail perspective, it's pretty powerful, right? So, you know, a lot more, a lot more um, retailers and, you know, uh, big, big industries are now shifting towards this. So it, it's going to be huge, you know. Um, I think you know, even even with fashion and how now like substance is now you know doing a lot more fabrics, and you're able to create you know garments, and obviously be able to bring them in and see how like a t-shirt would look on somebody. You could map it to their body, right, mm. and see how that would look, or a cloak, or a dress, or whatever it may be. You can map it to somebody straight away. So I think it's going to be it's going to be big and a lot of different, even in architecture visualization. You've created a 3D building. Um, you've textured it all out. 
I want to now go to the site where this building is going to be. I could bring that model in, scale it up, and actually visualize how it would look in the in the in a, in an environment, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. There's going to be lots lots more happening in that space. Yeah, and I think also as they're finding really good reasons, it's it, it's funny because there seems to be so many superfluous reasons for it. And then every now and then there's an amazing one. I saw uh, there was an airline, I don't remember in what country, and it allowed you to um, see if your bag would fit in the overhanging thing at home. Oh, wow. And it's just like, of course. Like, oh, that's a great, great yeah. example. So rather than, you know, rather than getting your bag there and going through the line and going, oh, no, it's not fitting and testing it in that thing and having to take stuff out of the airport, you could do it at home, uh, which I just thought was yeah. great. Like, there's probably so many applications we're not even thinking about, um, and those things will pop oh. up with that tech. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, I did a, the Make It trip last year, oh, earlier yeah, earlier in the year, and it was, you know, feels the like fact a year that ago, Aero, wasn't it, when you could travel? I know, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> um, but, yeah, being able to actually bring in a Photoshop file into Arrow and splitting out your layers and getting that parallax, you know, to me is just, you know, and you, there's some, some really great artists on um, Instagram that are doing you know, playing in that space as well and bringing their artwork into into augmented, into AR and just having lots of fun. And it's just, it's adding another dimension to their artwork and it's really, really cool. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. I might ask one more question. Um, is UV map the same as a texture? Technical question. No, it's, it's different. So your texture is your 2D image that then gets laid on top of your UVs. So right. you're using the UV. So, so as I explained in, I think it was episode one, was think of the UVs as a second layer or, you know, a second layer that goes on top. Really, it's it's the coordinates of where that texture map will position itself. So if you use, move mm-hmm. the UVs around, uh, you know, it's, 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 yeah, think of it like a second layer. It's not the same thing. Right. Cool. Awesome. Um, cool. Yeah. That's probably that. That's probably us for now. Yeah, awesome. So I'll just get through this. So yeah, I just wanted to put a bit of a spotlight on you know the question these because it's it's a big area as well. It is a big decision not only for you but you know for your parents that are going to be forking out money to to do these types of courses. And a lot of students you know get wrapped up in marketing you know uh, marketing campaigns with a lot of these schools and they're not really asking the right questions. You know they see finished products and like, wow, that's what I want to do and all the rest of it. But, you know, there's there's a lot of schools out there that, you know, are not keeping up to pace with where right. the industry's at. So these are really key questions that you should take away. If nothing else during this whole four episodes is just take this and, and make a note of it. I'm going to make these um, accessible to on the Discord channel for you, Flynn, just to be able to awesome. people to take away. But um, you know, things like you know, what what's the hardware and software that they're actually teaching? It, it might seem really simple, but you know, as we've had with every episode, people have been asking, you know, what hardware do I need? Right? Mm. And you need you need stellar machines. You need kick-ass machines that are going to do you know a really great job. If schools haven't updated their hardware and their computers, then you're going to struggle right, to be able to do this stuff. Yep. So that's, you know, like just just simple stuff like that, but people forget about that, right? Also, find out where the lecturers have, have worked in the industry, you know? do go, to, go on LinkedIn, check out where they've worked. You know, a lot of people, they'll go through the system and they won't actually even work in the industry and they get, you know, basically go back and start teaching. They've got no real world or industry experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they can't call on that experience to be able to troubleshoot a whole bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of sort of um, reasons why working in the industry gives you just a lot more experience, right? Yeah, um, that happens in a lot of a lot of fields, I think, the, the teachers, students becoming teachers and that, then teaching that, again that loop, is a bit of a... Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's not just this industry, but these are things that you need to think, ask about. Mm. Um, you That's know, great advice. What's the... T- What's the success rate of past students that have got jobs? You know, how have they ranked even in something like the rookies? Find out how well students are doing because, you know, you might have a, a great teacher that's st- uh, teaching at one school, but once that person leaves, it's, it changes the whole dynamics, right? The school's only as good as a lot of the teachers um, and the hardware and the software, right? There's a couple of key things that people need to look out for. Also, how, when was the curriculum last updated? You know, as you've seen from this 
present, you know, these episodes, the hardware is constantly changing. And we, we're running at such a rapid rate with this industry that, you know, a lot of schools and universities fall out of sync with software. Mm. And they'll be teaching something that was, you know, 10 years ago, we were, you know, using that product or that software. So really just make sure that they're teaching the latest software. They've got the best hardware. Um, they've got great teachers. Your success rate of students is good. They've got in great industry uh, relationships. Um, they're doing networking events that you can, you know, make start building your own personal network. So these types of things. Um, really, really key to, to, to be uh, asking that sort of stuff. That's great. And yeah, I just wanted to finish up by saying, hey, you know, there's some, some really great web links here for people just around this sort of information. Um, it's a recap, you know, of the sort of the job titles that we've talked that I've talked about during this whole four series um, piece, you know, and, and it's just, again, um, giving description of what the job titles are in the industry. Um, a beginner's guide, you know, where should I start? If you're a high school student, what should I be learning? Like I said, look for free stuff. There's so much free stuff online, on YouTube, and, you know, um, free software. Start with that first. Just really start playing around with it. See if it's even your passion. You know, you might get in there and just go, this is so boring or it takes so long or whatever reasons, but just really just start playing around with it and go back to things like photography and your art classes and understanding lights, colors, all that sort of really great uh, art foundations. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's all that sort of stuff. And can we, I'll grab those links from you after this stream and I'll just share, we'll just share them in the Discord as well. So Johanna will throw that in. If you're not in our Discord group, um, we'll share some direct links to some of those so you can grab them straight after the stream. No problem, yeah. And then, yeah, there's just the mention of the school rankings. If people are really interested about where the best schools are in the world, then that's a really good reference point. Um, and then to, just to finish up, you know, these are some of my personal favorites of people to follow, like concept artists, 3D people. These guys are the, you know, the influencers within our industry. They're the heavy hitters. Again, these are all links. I'll send them to, to Flynn. He can upload them and do that whole thing. Um, awesome. But, you know, again... And look at the look at the ones that are doing great things and be inspired by these people. Um, you know they they are always willing to give back. They've they've been there. They've they've started from nothing and and worked the way through the industry. So um, and a lot of people are doing their own YouTube channels and giving back with with free tutorials and stuff like that. So definitely check the check them out. The most amazing work. Awesome. And lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that's tuned in for these. Um, last four episodes it's been uh, a whirlwind trip and like I said I feel like I've only scratched the surface for a lot of these different disciplines um, but I'm always available like feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn um, and um, yeah if you have any questions then again I'll be I'm, I'm, I make myself always available oh that's awesome well thank thank you so much like it's been it's been incredible and when we started this journey I was really excited because of my lack of understanding of the 3d world and didn't understand the 3D pipeline at the beginning, definitely didn't know about um, UVs, um, a lot of the software that was out there. I was definitely in the mindset of you need to have a beefy, beefy computer um, and lots of lots of the expensive software and things like that. You've proved that's not true. Um, there's lots of different ways to kind of dip our toe in the water. You can open up your web browser and there's so much to learn just that way. So uh, that's been one of my big takeaways um, and learning about all the different, like the how much is actually going on in in a, in a scene? Like, I mean, you showed the Black Panther one today. Um, showed the one from uh, uh, not Rango, the um, uh, the animation Coco. Coco, um, yes. <laughs> and how much was involved with the lighting and 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 how it's built and things like that. So it's been fantastic. If you guys are, yeah, obviously you're at the end. So I hope you enjoyed this series. Um, yeah, it's it's been fantastic. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm just going to very, very quickly bring up our schedule for the rest of the week because we're halfway through tomorrow. We're back uh, on Thursday, a little bit later in the day, 12.30 in Sydney time with Yori Napati um, with some more illustration and on Friday, some photo manipulation with Ramez. Um, so I hope you can join us for, for the rest of those days. Right after this stream in seven minutes, Andrew Hockerdell um, teaching you Adobe Illustrator. So stick around. We'll be in chat for that one. and We'll be following along. Alan, I can't thank you enough. This has been amazing. Um, really enjoyed this series and thank you so much for your time and expertise. 
Thanks for having me on, Flynn. I've really enjoyed it myself, and hopefully we can follow up with some more sort of specialized texturing substance stuff and, um, you know, really just burrow down into some of the uh, the cool stuff as well. Oh, that sounds awesome. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Have a good way. See, See you, Flynn. guys. See you, mate.